we know that racialized and black folks in this city, particularly those that live in neighborhood improvement areas, are gonna be the hardest hit and the earliest hit by climate crises. I come from a small island in Barbados, and it's really not lost on me that my family's history is bound up with the climate crisis in a really intimate way. Colonialism and the Middle Passage and the 400 years of slavery that brought forth the Industrial Revolution is what brought forth the climate crises. And it is profoundly problematic that the same bodies that were forced to usher in the Industrial Revolution have now been interwoven into the world's economic system and the world's political system in such a way that we are going to be hit hardest by the fallout. Different parts of the city are going to heat up in very different ways. And so what you get is something in most cities called heat island effect. And so if you're someone living in a neighborhood improvement area with very little green space, and you're living in a unit that doesn't have adequate um, air conditioning, mm. then what you're doing is essentially heating up and living in this disproportionate level of heat. And so one of the ways to sort of stabilize a city, and I think that's what a lot of folks don't recognize, is that when you advance racial equity and racial justice, um, and when you advance that through policy, through sustained investment, through evidence and research and academia, then you can get ahead of what's going to happen, and you can actually stabilize the whole city in ways that it wouldn't be if racial equity wasn't centered. We can't be in a city where some neighborhoods are thriving despite the climate crises, and some neighborhoods are completely crumbling in terms of infrastructure, communities, and people. Um, it won't work for anybody. So I think we build sustainable communities where no one's left behind by shifting the focus of voices and leadership. I think in the city, in neighborhood improvement areas, um, in communities across the city, there's been a lot of folks, racialized black folks, leading amazing work. And so what we need to start doing is convening those folks together and making sure that those voices are at the forefront of climate policy making, at the forefront of climate action. In terms of the lab's future, the idea is that we don't want to be um, sort of a mile wide and an inch deep. We want to have a relationship with one neighborhood over 15 to 20 years. Strong relationships, building strong tissues between the policymakers that matter for that particular neighborhood, doing the painstaking work of making sure those relationships are durable, and then receding into the back as the work takes on its own life. Canada is facing the biggest housing affordability crisis, I think, of, of its existence. Families struggling to keep up with skyrocketing rents. We're going to see more and more Canadians priced out of living in their communities. We know how to build livable cities. We know what we need to do to make cities that have healthy built environments um, where people can thrive. The trick is how do we make them affordable? How do we make sure that everybody gets to live in these cities? So for instance, you hear a lot of talk about the 15 minute city um, and the idea that we could all reach all the services we need for our daily lives within a 15 minute radius. But intensifying activity like that within a small area means that land values go up and it means that housing prices go up and it means that rents go up. Um, so it restricts who can actually enter into these neighborhoods. Toronto is now the second most expensive city in Canada to rent and to buy a home in. Affordability crisis is causing a lot of problems. How do we solve such a big and complex issue? We need a robust set of policies and regulations to solve the unaffordability crisis. So universities are huge actors in city economies. Um, this is particularly true of Toronto. So the university has a responsibility um, to be a leader on issues of sustainability and equity. So we need to be thinking more about how we do climate adaptation, climate mitigation, and we need to get buy-in of the public on these issues. At the U of T, we have a phenomenal community of researchers, faculty, and students working on the affordable housing crisis. At the School of Cities, we have the Affordable Housing Challenge Project, which focuses on solutions like community land trusts. We also have an effort uh, called uh, the Affordable Missing Middle, where we're looking at how to add gentle density to, to suburbs. And then we have a number of uh, faculty and students working on energy efficiency and 
in retrofits. But what we're all kind of realizing is what we need to do is, is get that knowledge out the door. That means that we need to work on the economy, the environment, and equity the three E's at the, at the same time and um, make sure that it's a win-win-win kind of situation. What I think is really important is that we move beyond this concept of just focusing on where the harm is and how do we reduce the harm? How do we reduce carbon? How do we reduce injustices and so on? Where, where we turn that into a conversation about how we can have mutual benefit. Universities have an opportunity to play a leadership role in terms of building sustainable communities. Uh, our St. George campus is a city within a city. Our population can be as high as over 100,000 people on any given day. And that puts us in a really unique situation uh, to be able to address uh, climate change and to create our campus and move it from being what is a carbon source uh, to ultimately a carbon sink. A great example is our geo exchange system going underneath the landmark project. That's slated to open later this year and is gonna be Canada's largest urban geo-exchange system. But what I think is even more exciting is that we're also as part of that project building a subterranean classroom. And that's gonna allow students right across uh, our entire institution to not just read about these technologies and read about you know, climate positive futures, but to go underground and see how it works and then hopefully start to take that knowledge and export it beyond our campus to where all of our students go in the future. There's a lot of really great programs that we've recently launched. For example, this summer, we're going to be launching uh, the Adams Internship Program, which is going to place some of our students right into organizations in our city to help them tackle sustainability challenges with what they've learned on campus. My hope is that sustainability becomes core to what we do at the university not just in how we address what we do operationally, more the day-to-day -day things that we see in terms of our own emissions, in terms of what we do from a waste perspective, but how do we start to broaden that and then have a great conversation with our students, with our researchers, and, and use that to both become agents of change, both what we're doing on campus, uh, but hopefully also start to export that off campus. The, the key part of sustainability is that we're designing a city in which future generations can thrive. A sustainable city is an intensely just city, a deeply just city. Um, and I think there's no other way to put it. In every institution, in every organization, in every street, in every corner.